So why do I drink cocktails over the top of really expensive server gear? Just to trigger people. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. And yes, there's another Chenbro NR12000 sitting in front of me. But this one is not going to be a primary use server, nor is it going to go into my home lab. Instead, this is going to be my new backup server. Now this is the second NR12000 chassis that I've purchased. The last one is a dedicated NAS for my home lab, so something that I can tinker with and try new configurations on, but something that I don't necessarily need to rely on for day-to-day -day operation. However, this server is going to function as my new backup system. Before we get into it, I do have a little bit of a confession to make. I wasn't necessarily using RAID as a backup, but I wasn't necessarily keeping the best backups either. That's because to keep good backups, you need to spend almost as much money on your backup system as you do on your primary system. And well, budget has been a primary factor, limiting the amount of storage that I have. The primary storage pool in my main TrueNAS system has been a collection of eight 8 terabyte HGST Enterprise drives, giving me a total capacity in a RAID Z2 of around 40 terabytes. And in the not even a year since I built that server, I managed to grow that storage pool up to 32 terabytes, which means I need at least 32 terabytes of backup storage to keep everything that I want. Yeah, these videos use quite a bit. Recently, I did a little bit of housekeeping and got that number down to 26 but that still means I need at least 26 terabytes of raw storage to create a proper backup of all that. I alleviated part of my storage problem by filling up the rest of my NAS with 16 3 terabyte SAS drives. Now these I'm not relying on on a primary basis because, well, 3 terabyte drives are pretty much inherently unreliable, but they did give me some added storage at a pretty low cost of about $22 per drive. I also moved some of my less critical data off the primary storage pool and onto those three terabyte arrays, meaning my craft computing data can continue to run almost worry-free. But it's only worry-free if you have a good backup solution. So I present to you today my new backup solution. This is again a Chenboro NR12000 chassis, which is a 1U 12-bay server. Inside of this system is just a basic 4-core 8-threaded CPU in the Xeon E3 1230v2. It's an Ivy Bridge chip with a 3.4 GHz clock and should be more than adequate to run as a backup server. For system memory at the moment, I have 16 GB of DDR3-1866 ECC non-registered memory, as the server will not use registered memory, nor can you add more than 32 GB to it. That being said, I do have a 32 GB kit on the way, it just didn't arrive in time for this video. I also added a two port 10 gigabit SFP plus network card. What's nice about having two ports is one of those is going to go up to my 10 gigabit switch to give 10 gigabit network access. The other is actually going to be direct connected to my TrueNAS server, meaning that any backup traffic generated won't actually touch my network. As far as storage goes, I figured I might as well fill this thing up to the brim. So it's got 12 six terabyte HGST helium drives also running in a RAID Z2. After the RAID Z2 and formatting was applied, I have about 48 terabytes of usable storage inside this box, giving me more than plenty to back up every single server in my home lab. And I think that'll do it for the hardware introductions. So I'm gonna go slide this thing back into my rack and I'll be back in just a minute and I'll show you how I'm gonna use this as a backup server. See you in a second. While Mirror Universe Jeff is lugging that 49 pound server into his rack, Editing Jeff here to tell you about today's video sponsor, Linode, because one of us needs to make money around here. Like I mentioned earlier, storage can be expensive, especially when you need to nearly double that cost just to keep proper backups. So whether you have a couple computers at home, a full server rack in your garage, or manage full-fledged data centers, instead of keeping your backups on-prem, why not let Linode host them for you? Linode features both block storage and S3 compatible object storage plans with prices starting at 10 cents per gig, making it easy and affordable to keep all of your data protected. But Linode isn't just for storage. They also offer virtual machine instances in just about any price or power range. And if it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode with services from shared CPU plans, massive dedicated multi-core virtual machines, and even GPU instances featuring Quadro RTX 6000 cards, there's no limit to what Linode can host for you. Visit linode.com slash craft computing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. And get your home lab, cloud business, or backup solution started today. That's linode.com slash craft computing. And now back to that other guy who keeps spending all of my money on eBay. 
And we are back. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as I got the server into the rack and fired back up, the postman knocked on my door and delivered my 32 gigabyte kit of RAM. So the backup server does indeed have 32 gigs now. But enough about the hardware, let's go ahead and dive into the backup configuration. And we're gonna do that by starting over on my existing TrueNAS server. So that is at 192.168.1.226. And as you can see, I have three storage pools, all of which I will be backing up in this video. And yes, I am well aware that I have one unhealthy pool in my server right now. Uh, all of the disks are reporting green as far as the smart status goes, but one of the disks, I believe it was disk 21, uh, said it had seven errors that it had to correct from. And even after they corrected the errors, uh, the unhealthy pool status remains. So I might need to actually pull that disk out and test it independently or just swap out the disk for another one. And scrolling down just a little bit further here, you can see that I do have both of these servers with dual 10 gig network cards. Again, one of these NICs will be connecting each of my servers up to the rest of the network. The other will be a direct link between them and that is where all the backup jobs will go. Now the way I'm going to configure my backups is through a pull replication. That is, I'm going to configure the backup task on my backup server and have it scrape the data off of my primary TrueNAS box. To get that all set up, I really only need one piece of information off of this main server, and that is, what is the network address of that secondary 10 gig link? And I've set that up as a static address between the two. So my primary box is 10.100.100.11, and on my backup server, if I go to network summary, it's 10.100.100.12. Besides the network address, the other thing that you need is to have snapshots enabled because that's actually what's going to replicate between one server to the other. So again, if we go back to my primary TrueNAS server and I go down to tasks and then periodic snapshots. And as you can see, all three of my storage pools have a periodic snapshot that captures once per day and I save each of those snapshots for one week. To verify that everything is running as scheduled, I'm gonna go down to storage and then click on snapshots. And for each pool and for each data set underneath, as these are set up as recursive snapshots, there should be a total of seven snapshots taken, one for each of the last seven days. And as you can see for the storage pool craft 44 terabyte, we have a snapshot taken on March 15th, all the way back to March 9th. And scrolling down, you can see all of the child data sets as well as the other storage pools have the same number of snapshots. So we are good to go ahead and start backing up this server. Jumping back over to the backup server, I have one storage pool set up as one very large RAID Z2 with a total of 46.08 terabytes available. Now I don't have any data sets set up yet, but I will be setting up a data set for each individual storage pool that I'll be backing up. So on the backup server, go ahead and go over to tasks and then click on replication tasks. Then we're gonna go over to add. Now this wizard is pretty cool as it does pretty much everything for you. Under source location, I'm gonna select on a different system because I am pulling from the TrueNAS server onto my backup server. The way ZFS replication works is through a ZFS connection direct connected between these two boxes. But since I haven't set up an SSH connection yet, we're gonna go ahead and create a new one. I'm gonna go ahead and name this craft-truenas dash 12, which is the name of my TrueNAS server. Under setup method, just leave this as semi-automatic unless you're backing up from a different ZFS system other than TrueNAS. Under TrueNAS URL, I'm gonna type in HTTPS colon slash slash, and then the IP address of the dedicated 10 gig card. So that was 10.100.100.11. Then enter your username and password. And under private key, go ahead and click on generate new private key. And if everything looks good, click on Create SSH Connection. Now, if everything worked properly, you should be able to click on the little down arrow right there and browse the storage pools on your TrueNAS server. So we are up and running, and there are my three storage pools. Clicking on the little arrow next to the storage pool will reveal all of the child data sets. Now, when setting up a ZFS backup, you can select to backup just a single data set, or you can select to backup an entire storage pool. The way I'm gonna do it is to back up the entire storage pool and then click on recursive. So I've selected the craft 44 terabyte storage pool and checked recursive. Now I'm gonna go over to destination and we're gonna set a path on this server where we're gonna store the backups. Yet again, browsing down and clicking on the craft backup server, I'm gonna create a new directory here, craft-44tb-z2. 
By default, any replication task you set up will be encrypted over SSH. It is a little bit slower, but it is a lot more secure. And if you are passing this over any kind of network, I would recommend clicking on encryption. For my setup though, I'm going to select no encryption as I am again, direct connected with a physical cable off of the network from one server to the other. And if you are happy with the way everything looks up here, go ahead and click on next. By default, your replication task will run daily at midnight and your snapshot lifetime will follow the same settings as your source data sets. Now again, the snapshots on my TrueNAS server are set up to capture once per day and hold them for seven days. And I think that's a pretty good starting point on my backup server. So we're gonna leave this as default. However, I will be setting up an additional snapshot task on the backup server to extend that timeline a little bit. And again, if everything looks good here, go ahead and click on start replication. Now I'm gonna do the exact same thing for my other two storage pools. So I'm gonna click on add. I'm going to click on source location on a different system. And since I've already set up the SSH connection, I can just click on craft true NAS 12 and then select my new source. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on my Valiant storage pool and then click on recursive. The destination again is going to be the craft backup server inside of its own directory. So forward slash craft dash NCC dash seven four two one zero. That's the USS Valiant, if no one knew that. Again, I don't need any encryption in my particular use case. So I'm gonna click on next. And then again, we're gonna use the defaults for scheduling and snapshot lifetime. So start replication. And finally, one more task for the defiant pool. So now we have all three of my replication tasks set up, but they're not gonna run until midnight because that's what the schedule says to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and force one to start by clicking on the little expand arrow and then clicking on run now. So clicking on the task manager, you can see it's already at four and a half percent. So now if we go over to storage and click on pools, you'll see that we have a brand new craft defiant data set that's been created and we already have one gigabyte of data transferred over. Now that we know it's working, I'm gonna go ahead and force start the other two. Reason being is there's about eh, 26 terabytes of data to transfer, which means it's going to take most of the night and probably most of tomorrow. So I'd rather get those started sooner rather than later. Back over to storage pools, and there are all three of our data sets. Now, the nice thing about using snapshots is the initial backup is going to take a fair amount of time because, well, there's 26 terabytes of data to transfer. However, from here on out, the only thing that will need to be transferred is the data that changes, not all 26 terabytes. But I mentioned I was gonna set up some additional snapshot tasks on my backup server to extend the timeline of my snapshots a little bit. And here's how I'm going to do that. On the backup server, I'm gonna go up to tasks and then click on periodic snapshot tasks. I'm going to add a periodic snapshot. So if we click on data set, you can see the replication task has recreated all of the data sets that were present on my TrueNAS server. So again, we can choose here to back up a storage pool or create snapshots for any of the child data sets. However, since I'm going to configure just one backup policy for everything, all I need to do is click on the storage pool and then click on recursive. Under schedule, I'm going to set up a weekly snapshot and I'm gonna keep the data for eight weeks. If I haven't noticed that the data is gone within two months, I probably don't need it back. By default, the weekly schedule will run Sundays at midnight, which is perfect because I usually take Sundays off. And if everything is set up to your liking, go ahead and click on submit. So now once per day, my backup server will pull any new data from my TrueNAS server and keep it backed up daily for seven days. It will then also keep one snapshot per week for two months, meaning that any time within that two month time frame, I can go back to a previous spot in time and pull data from. But what about my Proxmox servers? How am I backing those up? Well, there's a really cool feature built into Proxmox called Backup, which allows you to push a backup of any virtual machine that you have over to a NAS device. And so all of my Proxmox servers are set up to send backups to my TrueNAS server. And then the TrueNAS server is also being backed up to my backup server, which means I actually have two copies of my backup data for all my virtual machines. Now the setup for this is pretty darn simple. I'm gonna jump on over to my Proxmox server. I'm gonna click on the data center icon and then go down to backup. And as you can see, my Proxmox server is set to backup every Monday at 4 a.m. and back up all of my virtual machines to my Craft TrueNAS server. And if you ever need to recover a virtual machine from backup, that process is pretty simple as well. Simply click on one of the VMs that you would like to restore, go to the backup tab, and then you can see the backups that are currently in storage. You can click on one of those and click on restore. 
So as you can see, Proxmox has a built-in solution that is pretty darn slick. Now, I will say when I was planning this video out, as well as just thinking about how I wanted to take backups, I really did consider the all new Proxmox backup server. It came out recently and it looks pretty darn good. But the use case for running a backup server in my rack is to back up my TrueNAS server. It's not to back up the VMs. It's not that they're not important, it's just they're not critical. That and TrueNAS already has the ZFS replication task that works flawlessly between two machines and Proxmox, I'd have to kind of jury rig something together. So the easier solution won. I must say I am feeling a lot better now that this is set up, especially because my old backup solution was a RAID 0 of two 10 terabyte drives that I just kept offline most of the time and would try to run a replication to about once every two weeks, which uh, we all know how reliable human scheduling is. Now that I have the backup fully automated, I can sleep a little bit easier at night. However, there's also the task of getting all of that 26 terabytes of data pushed off site for a full 321 backup. And I haven't figured that one out yet, especially because I only have 50 megabit up. That's gonna be a problem for another day. And I think that's a pretty good place to wrap this one up. But before you go, let me know down in the comments, what did you think of this backup solution? And what do you use for your home or business servers? I'm genuinely curious to know. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Float Plane. Links are both down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. Also, if you're interested in any of the hardware from today's video, I will have eBay and Amazon affiliate links down in the video description as well. Go give those a look. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Here we go in another episode of Mixology March, and I'm pretty excited for today's drink, as I've never had this one before. It's called the Devil's Own, and it's essentially a new spin on a gin martini, but this time with some uh, orange liqueur and some Angostura bitters added in. It sounds pretty interesting. So first up, we're gonna add some ice to our shaker. Gin for today is one of my more recent discoveries and I've really been enjoying it. From Oregon Distilleries, it's their Dry Gin, a Pacific Northwest forged gin. This classic dry gin, birthed in the high desert, offers itself up to the palate with a crisp citrus bite, deepened by juniper and softened by pine. Well, yeah, it said it was gin. I certainly hope those are present. So one ounce of our dry gin. The recipe calls for one full ounce of vermouth. I'm gonna go with three quarter ounce of vermouth. I just want a little bit more orange in my drink than uh, vermouth, so. Much like Winston Churchill, I prefer my martinis with uh, as little vermouth as possible. As he once said, the proper amount of vermouth in my martini is for the bottle to angrily stare at my glass from across the bar. And finally, one ounce of an orange liqueur. I'm using Grand Gala. One reason I really like this one is it is a brandy-based liqueur and it is a full 40%. Also, you get a great orange taste with it without adding a lot of syrupiness to your drink, which a lot of the cheaper orange liqueurs tend to be, well, more sugar than liqueur. And finally, just a couple of dashes of Angostura bitters. And now we shake. Shake until you get just a little bit of frost on there. And then we're gonna strain this straight up into a martini glass. For better results, you should probably double strain this drink as uh, ice chips aren't really one of the things you like in martinis most of the time, but I just didn't grab my second strainer. I feel like that should have a garnish, although it didn't call for a garnish. I feel like a lemon would be a great garnish. I'm gonna give it just a little bit of garnish. <laughs> a little bit of lemon zest in there. And there we go, a devil's own gin martini. Um, I will say it started fairly cloudy, but it is starting to clear up there. Ooh. There's a couple of things about this drink I can tell you right off. Number one, adding that little bit of a lemon garnish, that was a good move. Number two, reducing the vermouth to three quarter, that was also a good move. Um, I can taste the vermouth, but it's way, way in the background. Instead, that that orange and brandy is playing so well together with with the gin. This is just outstanding. Someone in my last video commented that they didn't realize they clicked on a how to drink video. To that, I'll comment with, uh, this drink has a lot of orange in it.
it's not sweet, like, at all. This is a very dry, but still citrus forward drink. And adding that little dash of lemon, I think really did help. But uh, I'm actually really impressed with this drink. It ended up being a genuinely good martini.